walking into a situation that you know is potentially life-threatening at anything less than 100% is taking an unnecessary risk. Hello, everyone, and welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 430. Today, I'm joined by my guest, Sensei Raz Hilton. If you don't know me, my name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm the host here for Martial Arts Radio. I'm the founder of Whistlekick, and I absolutely love martial arts, which is why I do everything that I do. It's why we bring you this show twice a week. It's why we bring you all of the great products at whistlekick.com. And if you want to check any of those out, you can use the code PODCAST15. That's going to get you 15% off everything in the store. If you want to learn more about this show, maybe check out photos or a transcript or see all the other episodes, you can do that. It's all for free. Whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Today's guest is someone I've had the opportunity to get to know over the last few years. I've watched him compete in a variety of ways, and I've seen the spirit that he brings to his competition, regardless of what type of competing he's doing. He's a kind man, he's a family man, but he is undoubtedly someone I do not want punching me in the face. On today's episode, we talk about his traditional roots, his more modern competitions, and all the things that led up to where he's at today. So let's check it out. Sensei Hilton, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Glad to be here, sir. How are you today? Hey, I'm good. Glad to have you here. You know, it's been a while since we had somebody on the show that I know personally. We've done a long string of people that not only do I not know, but I've never met. People I've never been in the same room with. I, I've and and you're a bit different. I've I've watched you sweat and and <laughs> I don't know if you've bled while I've been there. I've watched you induce bleeding. That's for sure. Well. <laughs> may have happened a time or two, but I've definitely bled. It just tends to happen more on the training floor. That's all. Right. Right. Oh, I'm, I'm not suggesting for a moment that you don't take shots. I, I know you train. <laughs> I know you train hard, man. Uh, but good. I'm, I'm glad you're here. This, this is going to be fun because you occupy this really interesting space in that you are a atypical fighter today because your roots are really traditional. Well, yeah, I guess, uh, I mean, uh, as a, as a trend, it has been more prevalent just with the advent of social media and all, but generally speaking, yeah, I'd say, uh, people like me tend to occupy the minority. Yeah. Yeah. I remember the first time I, I saw you in a fight and at the beginning of, of your fight, you bowed and that was great. I mean, I loved it. It's still, it's still strikes me as odd that people find it odd. It, it, that's probably the one thing that I hear comments about more than anything. I mean, obviously I do have my own unique visage on visually somebody who's outside your norm, but that's probably the one thing that I hear that gets commented on the most. But for me, it just seems like the most appropriate thing to do. I mean, we both, it, I kind of liken it to the original uh, waivers that were signed uh, back in China, back in Okinawa, Japan. I mean, it's just such a long held tradition. You sign a contract, you say that you're going to engage in physical combat with a certain set of rules, and you're going to abide by those rules. And regardless of the outcome, there's honor and respect for both. It just seems like. Yeah, the thing to do. <laughs> and I agree. And I think that that's why it struck me. And I suspect that that's why it strikes other people is that here you are, you're, you're in a cage. You're doing something that is wholly non-traditional. And you're bringing <laughs> your traditional roots. You're bringing who you are into it. And I suspect that I'm not the only one. Well, I mean, you, you said that other people have commented on it. I suspect mm -hmm. everyone sees it. And it probably strikes them as well, but not in a negative way. I think for a lot of us looking at that, we know exactly what that is. And it's you showing respect. And in an environment where it's often encouraged to be disrespectful and flamboyant for the purpose of, of the business side of it, you have this personality that's 
I mean, your fight personality seems to be incredibly authentic. I don't know you super well, but we've spent some time together. <laughs> and I don't see a, a different person at all in promotional materials or, or in the ring versus the, the guy that I've hung out with at events. No, uh, no, I think you hit it right there. Um, I am who I am. There's no, I mean, obviously there are patterns around people that will change slightly, but generally speaking, who we are doesn't change. We have a set pattern that we tend to stick to, even though you'll see behaviors change, even though you'll see little things around us change, we are who we are. And the couple of times that I've tried to either expand or deviate hasn't benefited me. So I, you no know, reason to change in, in any real place. I'd say the only real significant change I've made is going back to basics. And that seems to be going pretty well at the moment. So again, uh, I like my pattern. I'm going to stick to it. What, what do you mean by back to basics? Well, there were, uh, so I have really taken a stance on being a healthier fighter, sticking to whatever my walk around weight is, because I feel like one of the greatest disappointments to the MMA community, to martial arts in general, is this whole weight cutting that's been more and more scientifically tuned so that you can be the biggest person in your weight class at any given point and that's as much as i appreciate the skill set the wrestlers have brought into the equation it's one of the most necessary skill sets you need in controlling range but one of it's one of those dirty habits that constantly talked about and it's actually being promoted as an effective win strategy and i find that to be just disappointing it, so i get back on this or i originally got on this platform because i was spending so long and so many resources trying to bulk up and get to the top of that heavyweight class but it just never felt good and the best I got was a little over 250 but I had to take so much creatine and taking so many calories that it just I was spending so much time trying to gain weight that it really didn't fit so I decided to go the other way see how low I could go and uh, that was actually right before my first knockout to uh, Jorgen unfortunately but what I found was that happy middle ground of this cruiserweight in MMA that's 225 pounds, which I tend to sit right in the low to mid 220s anyway when I'm just doing what I do. I'm, I'm a high calorie input regardless. I, I take in a lot and I burn a lot, but this is a happier place for me. And it's whether it's my diet, my training, my family life, just Sticking to keeping things simple and authentic is what's benefiting me. So, yeah, hmm. back to basics and sure. sticking to them being the most important part of that. <laughs> yes. Now, I'm going to guess that you're not the only person who feels this way, but you're the minority there, aren't you? I mean, I, I see a lot of conversation and people missing weight cuts and everything. So it's still the majority of Fights where they're dropping weight, right? Yeah. It's we're starting to find a voice. Uh I don't remember who, but there is one of the headline fighters in the UFC right now who is just talking almost verbatim the way that I've been about weight cutting being such a huge problem. And I think it was uh John Jones, who's another one who in stature is similar to me, and he's had troubles maintaining that 205 area. Yeah. There have been, there's been a lot of controversy around what substances he may or may not have been involved in and how long ago it was. And I, I, I don't want to get into all that, but he's someone 
who, just because we share a similar frame, I'd like to see him as a 225 fighter. He's, he's already phenomenal. Imagine how much greater the show would be if he was fighting at the weight that he walks around at. If he was comfortably operating inside that octagon instead of having that struggle. And I, I've said it in the gym a million times. You're, that paper that we sign says indemnity up to and including death. Walking into a situation that you know is potentially life-threatening at anything less than 100% is taking an unnecessary risk. Uh, I got to walk home. I need to be able to look at my children without them screaming in fear. I mean, it's a pretty scary face already, so why make it worse, right? <laughs> yeah. I want to go back. I want to unpack that a little bit. You know, mm-hmm. this, this uh, idea that Let's look at it this way. The majority of people listening have not been in an organized fight like this. Most yeah. people have probably seen something. So we don't fully understand what it's like to get in there. And we definitely don't understand a lot of the prep work. So, you know, at, first off, how much weight are people dropping? You know, what, what does that look like? Are people, is it, is it a five pound thing? Is it a 20 pound thing? Well, really, that depends on what weight class we're talking about. In, if we're talking, say, bantamweight or featherweight thereabouts, then sure, there are some extreme situations, but generally speaking, we're looking at around uh, 10 to 20 pounds. But if you get up into the welterweight and middleweight area, you've got guys who are generally walking somewhere north of 200 pounds getting down into there and actually I'm getting down into where for, for people who don't know what those weights are oh i'm sorry so welterweight in mma is currently at 170 and middleweight is at 185 and you've got guys and girls who are dropping down to there it's not as popular with larger weight classes inside america but uh, i mean uh, as far as the women are concerned but Popularly, men's weight classes where you see a lot of the exciting fights are somewhere around welterweight. It, it's a huge draw. It's real exciting. You get to see more of the agility and the technique of a smaller fighter, but you still got the knockout ability of a bigger fighter sitting in those weight classes. Now, when you're spending, say, oh, here, let me back that up a little bit. When you as a fighter are preparing, it's fight camp, which is give or take an eight week period where you are preparing yourself mentally and physically to engage in this competition. Generally around that time period is where weight alteration tends to occur, but what's become so popular is people being down within the last week, the last two or three days, the last 24 hours, who are using dehydration tactics to suck the water out of their body so that they're going around at only skeleton, muscle, organ weight in order to make the very top end of that weight class and then rehydrating in the 18 to however many hours before the competition the next day. Now, there's been plenty of research, and yes, it absolutely can be done, but again, you're not 100% when you go back in. And in my mind, it feels like kind of a waste of the two months that you just spent taking away from everyone in your life. Mm. Now, for me, that's life children. I've got somewhere north of 40 hours a week that I've got to work. And on top of that, I've got several hours of training a day. And as you can imagine, having basically an 80 hour work week, every single week for a two month period would wear on anybody. Now we're adding on the stress that you put on the body and the mind of 
dehydrating yourself deliberately before walking into a combat situation. It, it's a lot of stressors to put on yourself in a very short amount of time. And sure, some people do handle that okay, but as we're seeing more and more frequently, not every body type can do that. As you get older, it becomes more hazardous to your health, and, and it's just generally a bad plan. Mm-hmm. And that's just my opinion. Take it or leave it. Sure. Sure. And if someone like John Jones is talking about this, then do you think we may be on the cusp of a, of a movement? Could this be changing? <laughs> I really hope that it is a quick change. But yes, uh, every sport evolves, everything around humans evolves. So uh, there's change coming. And I believe there was actually mention of the cruiserweight division in those upper promotions anyway. And yeah, Dana may talk about this new weight division or that new weight division being something he won't do. But as media outlets continue to pick up these stories and as people with that high of a profile continue to clamor for this it's going to con- it's going to be a good business decision and 225 is a great bridge in between light heavyweight which is 205 and the top weight for heavyweight is 265 that is a 60 pound gap yeah Seems foolish to not have a middle ground in between there, especially where after the last heavyweight we fight that we saw was one of the biggest pay-per-view cards in the UFC. And both of the fighters, Daniel Cormier and Felipe Miocic, came in in the 230s. That's right in my ballpark area. There are big names and great fighters who are sitting right on the doorstep of exactly where I want to be. So, yeah, please. So let's, let's kind of flip that. Quite often on this show, we'll talk about people's goals towards the end. But I've got a feeling that as we talk about your goals, we're going to end up working backwards because we, we haven't talked yeah. about your background yet, which I know we're going to get into. So let me ask <laughs> you that goal question now. You know, you, you just, you just kind of said it. You're looking to let's say, move up and no, no disrespect to the fight promotions that you're working with now, but your goal is to keep growing as a fighter, it sounds like. Oh, of course. And all respect and gratitude uh, to New England fights here. NEF, uh, Matt Peterson and Nick DeSalvo have definitely given me a great foundation and I've been able to make my start here, but they're well aware of my goals. I don't make any deceptive movements They're, they know that my goal is to hit the UFC and yes having this ability to really kick off the cruiserweight division on a regional level gets me physically and mentally ready for what I'm pushing to have happen by the time I get there which is having a cruiserweight title available at the highest levels of this sport and there's already been movements with athletic commissions for that to happen i've seen a few different promotions here in the northeast who have done it so uh yeah i'm looking to move up and make it to the top of the food chain and if any of those big names are there waiting for me then all the better nice what do you have to do to get there what are the hurdles or the roadblocks or obstacles? Well, it's going to be a lot more of the same. There's a lot of time and effort and sacrifice. And that last word, sacrifice, tends to fall across all categories. There's a lot of time where I'm already working overtime at work and I'm going to the gym. That's time that I don't get to you know, sit down, relax, play a little game of magic with the kids. That's time that I don't have a date night with my wife. That's time where I don't sit back and relax and 
please don't, uh, I don't want it to sound like it's all work. I do love my team, my fight family, and all of my fans and all the great people who I've been able to meet through this. But no bounds about it, there's a lot of loss involved here. So I'm doing my best to continue to pay my dues here and meet every challenger with the same attitude. Yes, I have respect and I will honor the agreement that we're getting into, but I'm doing everything possible to walk out of every engagement with victory so that I can continue to move on. And uh, right now, that hurdle for me is Jorgen DeCastro. When man ever knocked me out, walked or turned around right after that, got on the Dana White Tuesday Night Contender Series, and is now fighting for the UFC. So, there's my first goal. I need to go and avenge that loss. And whoever steps up between now and then to get me there is going to be yet another hurdle. It, it sounds like you're choosing your words carefully because I, I know how passionate you are yeah. about this. And I know that you're within the context of the fight, you're aggressive, but you're also a very kind person, at least in, in my experiences with you. So it, it sounds like you're trying to find a nice guy way to trash talk. <laughs> I am 100% confident in the work that I've put in, the people who have trained me, the teammates who sacrifice with me that make it possible for me to get out there and do what I do. So, yes, I am definitely confident in my ability to secure the victory, and I've publicly and privately said the same thing. I want to make sure that every fight that I get into is going to end in a way that the ref uh, judges don't have to work. I'm going to finish every opponent and I'm not going to see that final bell. That's probably the best version of trash talk that I can do. And I'll always try to deal with that verbally in a measured manner because I mean no disrespect to whoever has done the exact same thing that I've done. I'm just always going to feel like I need it more. So let's go back now. Now that we know where you are and where you're going, where did mm. it all start? How did you find Marshall? <laughs> I, that's kind of a two-part story, really. Uh, first, I started learning how to box and learning about anatomy with uh, my father. Uh, he was born in 1935, so he was a bit older than most of the dads of kids my age, and that meant that he had some health problems growing up. So he was already dealing with neuropathy in his feet from diabetes and wasn't really able to show things the way that he wanted to. So. We, I started that with my younger brother. I was five, and he was uh, two years younger than I. So we did that for a few years, and then it became a lot of uh, explanation and description. And we continued that way as best he could, but it wasn't really what he wanted. So when I was 10 and my younger brother was eight, he found... Uh, my dad found a judo instructor in Augusta, Maine, and he was teaching down at the local YMCA. And for the life of me, I wish I could remember his name because uh, that man was the one who really started off. Uh, oh, that's funny. He was a brown belt in judo. Because I, I trained with him, too. Really? Yeah. Oh. And yeah, keep, keep going. I'm gonna I'm gonna dig in the memory banks and see if I can pull that Please up. Please do. So, uh, so descriptive. Uh, he was teaching down at the down at the local Y, and he, or no, I'm not sure if it was the Y or one of the local centers, but regardless, he was in Augusta, right around the circle where the old Tony High School was. Now, in there, he was he held a brown belt rank. Uh, his son 
was already full grown. He was a black belt. He was a Vietnam veteran. And we, he had a really mild manner of when it came to speaking about things. It was always kind of like a low, raspy voice kind of a thing going on. Salt and pepper mustache. Just a very calm, somewhat jovial guy. But generally, I remember he seemed very mellow except when it came to technique because he would describe things very, very gently. But when it came to doing it, it was just a split second of epic violence. And you would see it in a few students who I remember who had been with him for a long time. Um, When I was there, just before, I, I never got higher than yellow belt in judo, but right before I got my yellow belt, uh, he had a student named Amy, who was, now I was 10, so I was kind of tall, tall for my age, but still 10 years old. And this girl, Amy, was, I think, two or three inches shorter than me. And she gave me the first experience I ever had in real fear of engaging in competition with a smaller competitor. She was, I want to say late teens, but she was already a green belt and she was just fast and skilled. Just everything that she did was proper technique. And the way that this man would teach us brought it out. I mean, his son was, I think freshly black belted within a year or two from the couple of times that he came into our classes to show us his technique. But he always would remind us that even though his dad had a brown belt, that brown belt was frayed and tattered and worn. And regardless of what was around that man's waist, he was, well, he always said, my dad can always kick my ass, so don't forget it. That was what introduced me to the Eastern style of martial arts and really gave me the hunger for finding more. So uh, a couple of years later, uh, yeah, I was 12. I was in Boy Scouts and we really couldn't afford doing two things at once. And unfortunately, I think it was he moved or had to move for some reason and made the decision for us. But Uh, Like I said, I was young at the time. I didn't really get the full story, but it seemed like he had to go for some reason. But ever since then, I've just been doing what I can to study somewhere and do something. Even when I moved to Florida a couple years later, I've just always been looking to further that knowledge. Hmm. What was it about judo early on that that struck you? I can hear the way that you're talking about it, you know, very reverent it, it, it seems like it, it checked a box for you that maybe you were <laughs> eating at that time am i am i getting that right yeah i uh i don't think i really understood the impact that i had on me at the time i was very awestruck by what i was seeing and as i said the few years of training that i had up to that point was boxing so i knew mike tyson lennox lewis uh, Buster Douglas, Marvin Hagler, Sugar Ray Robinson is to this day my absolute idol when it comes to boxing. But judo, especially the way it was presented to me by him, completely turned everything that I knew up on its head. It wasn't about landing the perfect punch. It wasn't about having that kind of footwork. It was a different kind of approach to combat and having the explanation of the gentle way and then seeing what the gentle way actually meant was, yeah, awe-inspiring. It brought in a whole new world of exploration for me. Mm. And it gave me something that wasn't entirely my dad. So. Uh, kind of check the little rebellious box for me as well. <laughs> sure, sure. So I, I think I heard you say Florida. So you, you left Maine at some point and headed south? 
Oh, yeah. Uh, a lot of family drama and separation involved in that story, but generally, uh, the general bullet points are when uh, I was 13, uh, my younger brother had been running away, so he ended up in a foster family, and my older sister and brother were already uh, off at that point. My sister had her own family. Uh, unfortunately, my older brother had died a few years earlier, and funny timing, my father being from Jamaica, most of his family who had come to the States was living in Florida. So when they started reconnecting, um, um, again, I was 13, wasn't really aware of all the conversations and ins and outs of that, but it was decided that uh, my parents and I would move to Florida. And when we did, uh, I was 13, I'd already hit a couple of the growth spurts, so I was getting close to six foot, and I was kind of a husky kid. So being the big guy and being the new guy in eighth grade, looking like a high schooler, I was introduced to, well, what the kids call getting jumped. So first time I got three kids attacking me at the same time, I realized that regardless of how big I was, what I had learned up to that point, there was obviously more that I needed to do and more I needed to learn in order to protect myself and feel confident that I'd be able to deal with any given situation. And obviously there's no such thing as being prepared for everything, but I really had to go through that experience and go through some more rigorous training with a few other individuals while I was there. And I kind of, I bounced around from style to style. I learned from a few more vets. I looked into different academies, but really what drew me and what I think put the MMA bug in at that point was, uh, what was it? one of the boys that I was going to high school at the time showed me a video of Kimbo Slice just doing the street fighting thing. And one of my senseis, while I was down there, it was informal training. Uh, he had been a combat veteran and had had some formal training while he was overseas. And I went to him showing him this thing on the computer. I said, hey, is there anything like this around us? And he said, no, but we can, do, we can go for a drive. So we did. And that's when I kind of, for probably a 18-month period, I started finding all these kind of like underground promotions. You know, everybody thought they would get famous. So backyards, warehouses, parking lots, any weekend that I could get away with, I would. And we would go and train. And it was messy and it was, stupid and I was definitely a lot of places I shouldn't have been but it I don't know I feel like screwing up kind of led me where I needed to go you know what I mean yeah no I mean human beings learn by making mistakes <laughs> yes yes we do when you're watching that that video of Kimbo Slice and most of you out there it, even if you think you don't know who Kimbo Slice is you've you've seen Kimbo Slice he's he's incredibly yeah unforgettable visually if, if you pull up a photo of him and maybe we'll drop one in the show notes if you pull up a video uh, video or photo of kimbo you, oh that guy yeah he's he's incredibly uh scary he's a, he is a scary human being when you're watching that what's that it was uh really sad when he passed away but yeah. uh again hard living and lots of mistakes but they, again mistakes or not what he did right and what he did successfully put it out there for as girls like me who just needed some sort of outlet and yeah it was just it's on this youtube thing that nobody knew about but it but i mean look at what it's turned into i mean like you said there are people who visibly know this man who don't even know his name right absolutely now when you're headed to these backyard and warehouse events. I imagine that there was a part of you saying, you know, I, I want to do this someday. Am I right? Yeah, there was. 
Okay. But so there was no why? way in hell my dad would ever sanction anything like that. Re- regardless you know, he of actually, that. He never knew about most of my training, ironically enough, during those few years. Oh, wow. But what, what, was, what was the why? Was it, was it because it looked cool and you thought, you know, this is something that, that could be fun to do? Or did you have bigger goals? You, you, let me tell you why I asked that question. You don't strike me as someone who just kind of says, this seems like it would be fun to do. It seems like when you do <laughs> things, there's, a, there's a, a couple steps into the future, something that, that connects dots for you. Well, that's kind of double-edged. There's a, there's a strange dichotomy to a lot of my reasoning through my teens and my early 20s, and it was partially some depression aspects where I really just had very little regard for myself. I was experimenting with substances. I was sneaking around. Like I said, most, my parents had no idea the training I was doing. I was smoking, drinking, doing whatever. And it, as I mentioned, my brother passed away when I was 10. So there was a certain part of me that had already fallen over into that kind of a nihilistic aspect. And on the other side of things, it was one of the few instances that I felt like I had genuine control in the world. There's a certain, even when I just started up as an amateur here again, there's a certain rush, thrill, power, nervousness, anxiety, excitement, I've done a lot of dumb things and I've taken some really dumb things, but the still to this day, right up there with seeing my children born, my wedding day, I, there are it, that moment of victory when I win, when I have figured out the puzzle and moved all the right pieces into the right place where I have stopped someone from being able to engage in combat with me. That's the level of emotional high that I get when everything clicks into pace into place and they just stop. It, it really is complete polar opposite world that I was living in at the time and that was what kind of uh, saved me and kept me going for a while. I suspect to people out there who haven't felt those things that haven't had similar experiences that the idea of this of of combat or fighting or, or, or whatever you want to call it, intense training as a, mm, yes, as, as a intense training. alternative. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, and, and I, I use those words cause I know there are people that don't like calling what happens in a ring a fight because to some people it, it's not a fight because there are rules, right? So I'm, I'm attempting to be respectful of everyone and, and their definitions, mm-hmm. but sure I get that. But the idea that 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 would be an alternative to substances, I, I I think probably doesn't doesn't jive with a lot of people. And I'm not I don't I'm not criticizing. Hmm. I I can't empathize with it in that in that way. You know my my well, sure I get it. This is pretty it's short. Just I've discovered that it's really the last real addiction that I have left. Hmm. Is it really an addiction? I don't know. That's just the joke line that I use for it, but I really feel like it is something that I have to do. Mm. And because it feels like a need, it's probably the best way that I can describe it. And I've, I have left addictions behind. 
but this is the one thing that has been persistent in my life that I refuse to give up. And I, I've tried. I, when I was in my early twenties and I was going through my divorce, I honestly, even before that, during my family life, I was trying to stay out of fighting, stay out of martial arts in general. And I would just dabble a little bit with friends. But when crisis came around and I was dealing with separation and this new split family life, what kept me on track was martial arts and physical training and being involved in that regular sparring contact. And I mean, shortly thereafter, that was where we met was on the opponent circuit and it even the point sparring and that game of dexterity and agility just wasn't enough. And lo and behold, a couple years later, I meet Nick Ellie and then it's, everything falling into place and I just have to get back into the sport because this is the way that I can do it as an adult without ending up in some unsavory circumstance. Your karate instructor is someone that we've had on the show, someone that I, I know well, someone I consider a friend. And someone who I'm a huge fan of. <laughs> He's he does have a bit of a fan base, doesn't he? He's he is a <laughs> he's a character. There are people out there who who say some someone is a character. No, that this man is definitely a character. How'd you find him? That would be again through the opponent circuit. Actually, he was. Uh, I had just earned uh, my black belt under him a couple of years ago and he described the first time that he had ever seen me, which was when I had performed a uh, psychata at, uh, I think it was the turn uh, battle name back in 2013. And it was just passing contact here and there. You know, we'd say hi, chat a little bit and uh, talking, but I really feel like the one moment and, most of your audience is going to know what I'm talking about. That one really endearing moment that kind of cinched it for me. He was somebody who I really enjoyed being around and wanted to get to know more was the fact that the day of that tournament, every time his ring concluded, he would be lifting one of those kids up over his head when they had won first place. So for all these competitors, yeah, it's great to win a trophy, but that guy's going to pick me up. Shihan Andy is going to make me fly when I win. That's the fact that he put himself out there and really has fun. What making them have fun was what really endeared him to me and to my stepdaughter Geneva. And that's why we ended up bringing her to him when uh, we left. Stanford because he I mean there are some great practitioners up here but she'd already made the choice and without realizing it so had we so yeah it, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll never forget uh, when my wife Janice had brought her in to try out class over there she came back and here's the funny thing. Janice was the one with tears in her eyes. And she's describing Geneva walking in saying, I'm home. That's the deal for me. And I just started tagging along from there. And yeah, I guess the rest became history now, huh? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, he's a pretty special guy. And, and of course, folks, we'll, we'll drop a link to... She had Andy's episode in, in the show notes. If you're new to this show, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com is the easiest place to find all that. Please do, yes. Yeah. yeah. We've talked about a lot of different stuff today. And, and you know, we've still got some time. We're going to keep talking. But I'm curious because as you, you get this opportunity and as you take the opportunities that have been presented to you, you get exposed to a lot of different people. I mean, we, we know a ton of people in common and not just through competition, but just because 
I grew up in Maine and you're now in Maine and you grew up in Maine and Maine's oh, yeah. not that big of a place. I mean, physically it's well, a good size, but you know, martial arts yeah. in Maine is, is kind of tight knit. Maine's just a small town, Jeremy. You know that. It is, well, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a very big town compared to Vermont, but <laughs> it, it is a small town. <laughs> Fair enough. Who, who do you want to train with? You know, let's, let's say you get some opportunities coming your way and you say, you know, I, I really want to round out this or, you know, I've always admired this guy or whatever. Who, who would you want to train with? I think outside of your audience, Nobody's really going to know who I'm referring to. So, again, local. Uh, one of the instructors who we've become acquainted with, again, through Geneva, um, is uh, Mr. Peterson, Eric Peterson, who's just a few towns away from us here. And reason being, I uh, I had a few years Mr. Kenneth kind of Chavone over in North Conway, who introduced me into Kempo in his particular style of Kanchiyunji. And I had always regretted not having more time and being more available. And one thing that I do want to do is delve back into the world of Kempo just for myself it wouldn't be necessarily a rank thing but one thing that i really am grateful to shihan andy for is the fact that he's been able to really express shotokan in a beautiful and friendly way and appreciate the history and as well as where it's going what most, what a lot of people don't really talk about or delve into as often as I think we should is the fact that Okinawan martial arts are all tied together. And yes, there are different styles and little variations that we would do well to remember and understand. The beauty of Shotokan is that it is a great evolution and a great place in the evolution from the more from pre-Shotokan or pre-Shurite, whichever you want to put that dividing mark at, where you see a lot of the Chinese influence, a lot of the Shuanfa from the Chinese mainland, and then where it evolved and became more Japanese and where things were streamlined and formalized more. Shotokan holds a middle place. And I've had a really fun time and a really beneficial and fulfilling time from Kempo, Taekwondo, Shotokan, and a myriad of Chinese influence and direct Chinese styles that have been hybridized or mixed in through the course of my training over my entire life. And the, as much as I will train in Shotokan and under Shihan Andy for as long as he'll put up with me, uh, one, one place that I'd like to go back to would be Kempo. And from what I've seen with, Keon Peterson and the students, uh, Sydney Mason, good friend of my daughter Geneva. They, it's yet another great family atmosphere, and he's another person who takes what I feel needs to be taken seriously seriously, and allows for the levity for individual growth. It's a great attitude in the martial artist. Mm. right on right on when you look at your fighting style you know you're certainly the a conglomerate of of a bunch of different people and a bunch of different i am training. a mutt yeah well, i mean and we all are i think i think we all <laughs> are you know even even if you're training a single style that style came from some amalgamation somewhere along the way so oh uh, yeah 
you know, I, I, I get a little irritated when people talk about, you know, martial arts purity. It sounds weird to me, but anyway. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what, what part of your game, and, and I suppose maybe, maybe this isn't, I'm going to ask a question. You certainly have the freedom to not answer it. Yeah, future opponents are listening. What part of your game needs the most work or, or what puzzle pieces do you want to add? That's probably a better way to look at it. <laughs> okay. That's no secret to anybody. And it's not one that I'm missing, but definitely one I need more work in. And that would be wrestling. And they, I did just mention a little while ago that's one of the integral pieces to the MMA cage puzzle that has the biggest influence on the outcome of a lot of fights. And it's very obvious when it's not there that it should have been. It, there's a control of distance that wrestling takes a hold of and keeps a hold of you of your opponent but also whoever is engaging in the wrestling game in the success in the most successful way is more often going to have a more favorable outcome it's it, fortunately i have john rayo as a head coach and he's been it, He's been kind in uh, in his appraisal of me, but there's definitely a lot more to learn for me and a lot more time that I will be putting on the mats in order to improve that. But and that's the one thing that I would say I have the least amount of experience in and one thing that I've been able to continue to improve with the help of him and my training partners in the mats of the first class. It's absolutely necessary for anybody who's looking to compete in MMA. So make no mistake, I know what my biggest hole is and I am continuing to hammer on it as much as it's allowable. And now for kind of the the last question, the last real meaty question I'm going to ask you, because at the end of the day, this is not an MMA show. You are the first fighter i mean real i mean we, we've had kickboxers on but i've intentionally turned down quite a few pro fighters that have come that have wanted to be on the show and you know it's no secret we reached out to you because i have the utmost respect for you and i think that you're able to have a foot in two different worlds you know, you, you have one foot in the traditional martial arts space, which, of course, is the hallmark of whistle kick. It's what we do here. We talk about that. So I'd love... Well, I am both grateful and honored. Thanks, Jeremy. Well, thank you. Of course. Thank you. I mean, there, there was no better candidate. And the last piece that I want us to talk about, mm -hmm. because it, as I already said, the majority of people listening today aren't going to empathize with the desire to step into a cage and fight. They may it's appreciate it. What's that? It's not something I'd suggest for most. <laughs> no, no, it's certainly not for most people. And I would argue that a good portion of the people that are doing it probably shouldn't be based on what I've seen. <laughs> mm. <laughs> that's, yeah. right. that's a whole different discussion. That we, I don't think we need to go that, that road. I don't think we have no, that. no, we don't. And and we're also trying to keep this positive and not speak ill of others. Amen. So for for the traditional martial artist listening, can you help us understand how how you hmm, choosing words? How do you mm -hmm. navigate these two different worlds and thread them together? Because at the top of the show, we talked about this amazing okay. visual of you in a cage and bowing and how foreign that is. And it doesn't appear that you've caved to this kind of cultural pressure of mixed martial arts to become more like them. But you're also, the, your tradition in mixed martial arts is just as big of an anomaly as you being 
someone who participates in mixed martial arts competition as a traditional martial artist. So that's pressure no matter where you are. You're, you're kind of maintaining this, this uh, element of being, depending on how you look at it, an outcast or very unique. Which sounds mm. like it's been a bit of a thread for you through your life. So if, if you would, talk just, what is that like? What, what is it like to be the MMA guy when you're in the dojo? And the karate guy when you're in the cage. That's really funny. I was totally referred to as the tall karate guy originally by uh, people who didn't know my name at that point. Um, And for people listening, how tall are you? Oh, (laughs) well, there are... (laughs) varying reports however i am actually six foot six so i'm i just get to say i'm six and a half feet tall it's uh both a blessing and a curse really is but uh to answer your question i here's the thing when I finally decided that I was going to pursue entering the cage and just seeing how it was, the goal that I had was purely to become a better instructor. I had spent the previous couple of years trying to learn a system so that I could become a teacher. And that's really the overall ultimate goal for me at the end of all of this, wherever it leads is to be an effective instructor. And the only way to my thinking of being the most effective instructor that I can be is to put myself in sequences and situations and circumstances where I am able to test and refine techniques. Now, once upon a time, decades and in some circumstances, a hundred or two years ago, you'd have to go out and find somebody and fight them. As we've come to this modern age, it's not really, well, it's frowned upon to say the least. And there's a legal action when we get to the higher portions of that. But the point is, I needed some way to take whatever system I settled on and test things in a structured, controlled manner where I could repeatedly use things and decide whether or not they worked, and if so, how they worked. And that really is still my goal. As much as I love the fight, I love the physical lifestyle and I love getting out there. And like I said, the feeling of winning, there's nothing quite like it, but there are a few things on the same level. That's really what I'm doing is I'm putting myself in a position where I can prove to myself and later when I develop a curriculum to my students, yes, these are things that work. This is why they work. And I can prove definitively that they do or don't. There are portions of traditional martial arts that have already been proven have no place in the cage. But to this day, doing kata in class with the kids gives me light bulb moments of inspiration where I realize that something within the kata that I'm working on has direct relevance to my competition in the cage. And it, my last fight actually goes and proves that when I was able to use portions of the techie 
sequences to stay in control and continue to stay unharmed as I move to a more favorable position. There's moments in any type of a highlight reel fight promotion where you've got fighters doing this, that, and the other thing. And actually, the wonders of YouTube, there are actually people who have done compilation videos where you show a portion of a kata and then you see a clip of a fight and the application of that kind of the bunkai, the, how it works, what you're doing, standing there by yourself, walking up and down the floor and screaming at certain points is not exactly what you're going to be doing in a genuine fighting circumstance. But the lesson plan will give you the movements and the positions you need to really exploit whatever situation you're in. Mm. It, this is a all Michael... a big test. Yeah. All of it. There's a Michael Jai White movie where he does that too, where it flashes back and forth between him doing kata and him beating the tar out of someone. Oh, I, the movie. I think I heard about that. I need to see that movie. I don't know what it is, but I'm going to find it. We'll, 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 for some reason, Falcon Rising is what's coming to mind, but I don't think that's it. I, I think I just that's the most recent one I saw. Um, yeah, we'll we'll try and find that and drop it in the show notes. Oh yeah, please do. Uh, he's ex- he's ex- I, ex- I want to know that. <laughs> cool. Yeah, yeah. I can I can only imagine those light bulb moments and how fun that it's coming from something that is so often criticized as being impractical. I mean, it, it, there are so many examples, and we've had so many conversations on this show about how kata makes you better for I, I should use the general term how forms makes you better at no, any aspect of your martial arts so glad to hear someone who is utilizing it much more frequently in it in a much more intense way than the majority of us saying yes this is important oh yes it is now if people want to find you online they want to connect they want to keep an eye on your career, how would they do that? Then, please, I am frequently putting up Facebook posts. My fighter page is my fighter name, uh, Rasquatch the Jamaican Shamrock, uh, Ras Hilton, R-A-S, last name H-Y-L-T-O-N. No, it is spelled with a Y. I uh, didn't make it up high enough in the alphabet to get the royalties, unfortunately. And, oh, I recently just started Twitter. That's Hilton.Rass. And as always, I'm right there on Instagram as well. That usually goes directly to my Facebook. Instagram is Rasquatch MMA. So please drop in, have a look-see. I'm constantly updating and keeping things going there, letting you know when events are happening. And especially, uh, you know, it's fights happening. I do like to drop in the show notes for my own page to just mark these moments in life, whether it's uh, another competition or uh, recently I just posted how one of our senseis is going off to college, which is a bittersweet moment. Mm. So there's uh, a little bit of life in with the uh, fight life. And as we end here, what parting words, what wisdom or advice or just final thoughts would you give to the people listening? A uh, line that keeps on coming up for me that I feel ends up translating into a lot of different areas and to a lot of different people. For me, the line is use your length as your strength. Now that coming up in striking and jiu-jitsu and wrestling and all the different skill sets, but what I'd like to broaden that term out to be is you have your own set of tools, your own set of skills. Use it. It's all perishable. Nothing is permanent. And when we do get to those 
final stages, those final years of our lives, if we're lucky enough to get there, most people find that the biggest regrets are not decisions made and failures that have happened, but it's moments where you had the opportunity to take a risk for the betterment of yourself and you didn't. It's always decisions that were not made that people tend to really lament over. So if you're small, use it. If you're big, use it. The thing that I appreciate most about Sensei Hilton is that despite his goals, despite the fact that he's trying to do some really big things, he's always up for helping others. He's always available to support and to give of himself. And I don't think that those two are a counter. In fact, when I read or when I talk to people who are immensely successful, every one of them, to a T, is willing to support and help others. And as some have said about that being a necessary element to success, if it's at all a big component of success, I have no doubt that Sensei Hilton will be immensely successful because of his attitude and his willingness to support others. So, in that spirit, sir, thank you for coming on the show, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. If you want to check out photos and so much more, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. If you want to see the stuff that we make, that's at whistlekick.com, whether it's products or the other projects we're involved in. And if you do make a purchase, use the code PODCAST15. That gets you 15% off everything. Use it as much as you want. Let us know that you're supporting what we do, and you appreciate the show. If you want to help us in another way, you can share this episode or another episode or follow us on social media. We're at Whistlekick everywhere you can imagine. And if you want to email me directly, jeremy at whistlekick.com. That's all I've got for you now. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. 